So this is my first walk and talk video. We're gonna talk about calculus today. Hopefully I won't go off on a tangent. I've been walking a bit lately to try to get a little healthier. Perfect opportunity to try to record a few videos, talk a little bit about mathematics. In fact, today I wanna to talk about calculus. So calculus is the study of how to analyze functions. A function is any kind of input-output relationship that you see in nature. So for example, you can see these cars driving up and down the road here. Of course, as soon as I say that, there isn't a single car driving up and down the road, but uh, here comes one right now. So you can see this car driving up and down the road here. Now that car has an input-output relationship on it in relation to its position and how long it's been driving. If a car like that keeps a constant speed, you can figure out how far it goes by simply looking at how long it drives at that speed. So for example, if a car is driving like the speed limit here, you can actually see is 45 miles an hour. So if a car drove on this road at a constant speed of 45 miles an hour for two hours, you probably can figure out that he would travel 90 miles. This road ain't 90 miles long, so it wouldn't get that far, but just for the sake of understanding what that means. So the input is how much time they drive, and the output is how far they go. They can only pick how long they're gonna drive in that car. They can't pick how far they go because that's set as soon as they choose how long they're gonna drive and how fast they're going. So that way of making it unambiguous what the output is, that locking down of the output is what makes it a function. So a function is an input-output relationship where when you put an input in, you know exactly the output that's gonna come out. So what calculus does is it's actually first interested in how fast those input-output relationships change. Now for the car that's coming down the road, the input-output relationship is the input of time, the output of distance. So what we mean by its rate of change is how much the distance changes when you change the time a little bit. So for example, in what we were just talking about, if we had that car going 45 miles an hour, travels for two hours and goes 90 miles, like we just said, we can figure out its rate of change by taking that 90 miles, which is how much the distance changed and dividing it, or which is a way of comparing it, dividing it by how much the time changed. So it took two hours to drive there, so the time changed by two hours. So that's 90 divided by two, which produces 45 miles per hour, which is exactly what we said its speed was. So what we just learned is two things. The first is that if you wanna understand the rate of change of an input output relationship, you wanna compare the change in its output to the change in its input. So you usually divide these two things. So we divide the change in output by the change in the input. The other thing we learned is that the rate of change of distance with respect to time is speed. In fact, that division is reflected in the units we use for speed. So speed is 45 miles per hour, right, for that car. The per means divide by. So that's 45 miles divided by hours. So that's actually how we can remember how to compute that. So now let's think about drawing a graph. The horizontal axis we'll use is time. The vertical axis we'll use is distance. If we draw a graph of that car we just did at zero, zero, so zero time, zero movement, it's gonna be at the origin, okay? As it moves for two hours, okay? So we go two over to the right on the horizontal axis because we move two hours. And then you're gonna move up 90 miles on the y-axis because that's how far we went, and draw a straight line between them. Well, once you draw a straight line there, you can compute the slope of that line. And how do you compute the slope of that line? Well, you take the change in the y-axis, remember the y-axis is distance, so that'd be change in distance, and you divide it by the change in the x-axis, rise over run. Change in the x-axis here is time, right? So your rise over run relationship for this particular graph is actually the same computation you did for the speed before. Change in y-axis, change in, in uh, distance is 90, divided by the change in the x-axis or the run, change in time, which is two hours, 90 divided by two is 45. 
The slope of that line is the speed of the car. So when we depict a function, the slope of that function is gonna be how fast the function changes. This is the key fact in differential calculus. Now, in our example, we only used the car that was going a constant speed for two hours. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually driven a car, probably a lot, I would expect. If not, you've been in a car. Have you ever seen a car go the same speed exactly for two whole hours? You might get a chance to do this on a long drive on the freeway, but even then, a lot of times there's traffic, it's gonna slow you down because they hit their brakes. Maybe there's an accident, there's a whole bunch of things that can make you force you to change your speed. If you're in a neighborhood town like this one, you're changing your speed all the time. So the likelihood that you're gonna keep a constant speed all the time is pretty rare. And in fact, in most input output relationships in nature, how fast they change is different all the time. So they don't have a constant slope. Their rate of change changes itself. So first, if we have an input output relationship where the rate of change changes all the time, how do we figure that one out? It's not a straight line anymore, right? If you look at a graph of something where the slope changes a lot or the direction it's going changes a lot, it's not gonna be a straight line. And so how do you compute the slope of something whose slope is changing all the time? You know, let's take the example of that car we were talking about, inputs time, outputs distance or position. Uh, and let's compute uh, a few things. We can measure where it's located and at what time that happens. So we'll do that at one point in time. Okay, so let's say we have a graph and it's going a little all over the place, right? Maybe it's turning around or whatever. Sometimes it's going backwards, whatever, just for the sake of making this look uh, easier to do on a graph so you can see the differences here. So what we'll do is we will measure where it is at what time at the point that we're interested in knowing how fast it's going. Okay, We'll call this time T0. We'll call it the position it has S0. Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll wait a minute, wait a couple of seconds and measure it again measure its time a little bit away, and measure how far it went in that amount of time. Second time will be T1, position will be S1. Then we want to understand the, we want to approximate the slope there. So we'll compute the slope between those two points as if they were a straight line in that, in that region. And so what we do is we take the difference of how far it traveled, so its position at the second time minus its position at the first time, tells me how far it's traveled. That's its change in position. We divide that by its change in time. When we do that, we get an approximation of how fast it's going. And in fact, if we check where it is along a shorter amount of time, we actually get a better approximation. Because remember, his speed is, their speed is changing all the time. But if it's over a small time interval, the speed doesn't change very much. So if we compute it over a small time interval, we'll get a pretty accurate measurement of how fast it's going. And you could actually try this if you wanted. You could set up a little experiment, uh, set two people up at a certain distance apart, so that'd be easier. Have them start a stopwatch at the same time and clock when a car gets from one point to another. Try to have somebody drive by those two points uh, going at the same speed and see if you actually calculate that the ratio of the distance that they traveled divided by how long it took actually measures what your friend's speedometer was reading. Fun little experiment. Now, the closer in time that we clock the second position, the better our approximation of the, of the car's speed is going to be. So if we look at this on the graph, we're computing this line between these two points here, which is called a secant line. As you can see, it cuts the graph in two locations like that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna shrink the amount of time between the first position we clock and the second position that we clock. As we move that second point, the second data point that we clocked, and move it closer to the first data point, this secant line, the two points that it's crossing through get closer and closer together. Well, the question might be asked is, what's the slope of the line that happens when those two points get right next to each other or become the same point? Now, the problem is, is we can't compute that directly because then the change in distance and change in time would be 
zero each and you'd get like a zero over zero fraction, which is undefined. So in order to figure out what the slope of that line is going to be as those two points move towards coinciding, we need another concept from calculus. And we need some kind of way of calculating where that slope's going towards. So what we'll do is we'll look at the slopes of the secant lines as we move it closer. And those slopes are gonna get closer and closer to the number as they move. What number they get closer and closer to and converge on when we move those two points together is called the limit of that number. And we can talk a little more about limits in another video because they actually have more uses than just this. But this is one example of where you would need a limit uh, in order to calculate this thing. So we take basically the limit of those secant line slopes and move it closer and closer together until we can get the slope of what's called a tangent line. Now a tangent line to a graph is a graph that goes through a point and is going in the same direction as the graph at that point. Since we already established that the direction a graph is moving in is its rate of change, the slope of that tangent line is the rate of change of that function. So if we had a car moving around near your town and you plotted its position as a function of how long it's been driving, you would get some kind of graph. That graph is not gonna be a straight line. It's gonna move around a bit as he slows and speeds up or whatever. So I've drawn here a graph that kind of looks like maybe what a car would do if it was going down a long straight road and had to start and stop for a few things. They like red lights, traffic, whatever. So it has to speed up and slow down. Now you notice that it's always increasing because it never turned around. It's not going to go backwards. So it's always going to be increasing its position. It's just driving down that road. What's interesting about this is that we just figured out that the rate of change of that function, its speed, at any given time is going to be the slope of a tangent line to that curve at any point. What that means is, is that if we draw a tangent line, say at this point here, an hour into the drive, the slope at that point is going to be what that car's speedometer reads. This is called its instantaneous rate of change. In calculus, we call this instantaneous rate of change at any point a derivative. And in fact, since at any point along that curve, you get a different instantaneous rate of change, but you know you only get one, it turns out that that time, that, that input that you had for the car in the first place has another output that you can talk about. And that output is how fast the car is going at any given time, which we can calculate by looking at any given time or point on the x-axis and looking at the slope of the tangent line there. So the function which relates that input and output is called the derivative function. And that's the main idea in calculus that we use is calculating this derivative, which tells us how fast an input-output relationship is changing. So this can be an input-output relationship, uh, say, between the car given its time. It could be an input-output relationship between any given time and population to say the United States or what city you live in at any given time, you can take a look at how fast a chemical reaction, say, occurs by changing the inputs there. Now, in that case, you might have multiple inputs because you have multiple chemicals that are combining together to produce something. And so you might get an equation that relates how fast those things are changing. An equation that talks about how fast things are changing, it includes that in the equation, is called the differential equation. Basically, in nature, we see that all sorts of rates of change depend upon inputs and other kinds of rates of change. And so, if we want to understand the world around us, it turns out that most of that language ends up being described using differential equations. And we use differential equations to describe things like motion, heat transfer, fluid flow, even particle movement are all described using differential equations that have these rates of change in them. To give you a few examples, here is Newton's second law of motion written as a differential equation. Here's the heat equation which measures heat dissipation. Here's the wave equation which measures how fast a wave moves, uh, like a sound wave. So many different kinds of differential equations. And practically every science 
uses these to describe the world around us. Physics uses them a ton to describe motion. Chemistry uses them to describe how fast chemical reactions are changing. And biologists use them usually to describe population. So that's the idea behind calculus. The idea that the slope of a tangent line to the graph of a function tells you how fast that function is changing at that given point. And understanding how fast things change is incredibly important in our world today. Differential calculus as a result is incredibly important in understanding the world around us. That's why you spent so much time learning about it. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the basic ideas of calculus without actually having to solve any problems. Because when it comes to mathematical literacy, it's important to know some of the big picture too. And that's what I'm hoping that these walk and talk videos can help give you. Big picture about different cool ideas, mathematics, and the other sciences without necessarily having to go through calculate a bunch of them. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hit that like and subscribe button. We'll catch you next time. So I saw this shot the other day called 46 chromosomes. Intrigued, I went inside and just as I suspected, they sell jeans.